Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'd also like to welcome you, introduce myself. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here, and we are uh, in the middle of a series called The Conversationalist. We're looking at some just some one-on-one interactions that Jesus had with different people and learning about him and then about how he interacts with us, but kind of also the bigger picture of what we're hoping to take away from this is if this is how Jesus loved the people around him, this is how God has called us to do the same. So we believe that God has called us to make a difference in the lives of the people um, around us, and we're looking at all these different ways that Jesus has been doing this. And if you've been around the last few weeks, I've been kind of telling this story, kind of referencing the story for me during my freshman year of college, where I kind of got this vision for a different type of life. It started with a really awkward, intense interaction with a guy who was a college minister who was working at um, uh, where I was going to school, and um, and then he met with me on a a Sunday night, actually during the Super Bowl, which was kind of weird and awkward, and he kind of shared this um, illustration with me, and we talked about it last week, where really for the first time I understood that there was a difference between someone who just simply says that they're a Christian and someone who is uh, passionately following Christ, a, a disciple of Christ, and he challenged me to kind of to think about where I was and where I wanted to be, and it was kind of the beginning of kind of a kind of a switch that flipped for me. And I would say over the course of the next few months, uh, being in this small group, uh, be kind of being mentored by this guy, the friends that I was making, that really my life began to change. Certainly, my perspective about life began to change, and I began to realize, okay, well, not only is God wanting to do something in me, he's wanting to use me, and he wants to use me here at the campus where I am, and so I, I kind of kind of caught this fire, but let's just say it was a 19, 20-year-old uh, fire. It was, it was not really well refined, certainly not for me. I was a lot of intensity without a lot of sense, at least that's kind of how I was. No offense to anybody 20 years and younger here. Maybe you're probably way more mature than I was. I was, just, I was a lot of intensity. And I decided, we're kind of at this place where it felt like to us it was difficult to be a Christian. And so we decided that what we needed to do, we needed to be about truth. And so we spoke truth to people. And it did not matter if it, about your feelings don't matter with respect to truth. It doesn't matter. You, there's some things you need to know, and this is what is right, and God is right, and what you're saying is wrong, and what you're doing is wrong. And then, you know, you, you would do this, you know, I'm sure leave, leaving wakes of damage everywhere, but you felt really good about yourself because that's what Jesus was about. He was about the truth. And then it became to be about, well, not only was, was, you know, was it, are we supposed to be communicating truth, we're supposed to be doing it with boldness. And so then I became that guy. I don't know if you had one of these guys at your college or whatever. I was that guy in class who would just challenge the professor on anything and everything if it even felt to me slightly like it was challenging the Christian worldview. So it got to the point that if you were teaching a class, it was a relatively small school, if you were teaching a class um, that was... I don't want to say controversial, but just not Christian. Like, I, like as we were defining Christian at the time, right? You knew who I was, and you were you were you were disappointed when you saw me come into your class because I was just hostile. No, no, I wasn't hostile. I was bold. I was a bold truth teller, right? And so I remember this one in particular. Um, There's a paper. It was a New Testament class, and and she assigned this paper, and I knew exactly what she wanted us to write in this paper, but it wasn't the truth. And so I wrote the exact opposite of everything that she told us what was what was it was exactly opposite. and I felt really good about it and it was like two pages and then like a little bit on the third page and 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 I made it and I made an A on the paper. I think that some of these people might have been afraid to not give me an A and what kind of ruckus I might would have caused, but I'm sure it was actually probably a decent paper for a sophomore or whatever. So so she gave me an A, but on the on the whole sheet of the third page that was empty, she she hand wrote notes. And then on the back of that, filled that page, and I, I'm not lying to you, stapled a blank page of paper to the back of my paper uh, to just continue. And I was so proud of that because it was just a symbol of how I had been a bold uh, proclaimer of truth. And I'm not going to lie, it's been almost 30 years. I'm still a little bit proud of that, 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 she, that, her, that her response to my paper was longer than my paper 
And, you know, you just kind of, and you just, you justify it. Because I, I can look and say, well, here's, here's a time where Jesus is boldly proclaiming truth. And, and you just begin to kind of shape what you see about Jesus and kind of who you want him to be. And then completely on the opposite end of the spectrum, it's like, Charlie, you just miss out. I mean, Jesus is about being nice and being kind. He's about being accepting. And there's this story and this story and this story. And, and, and you see that. And, 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 and we, we take one story and we just make it that's who Jesus is. And my favorite way that people do this is, how, you guys know the story of where Jesus casts out these money-changing people at the temple? It's okay. Not very many. Okay. Oh. Um, so anyway, there are these people that are outside the temple, and they're essentially kind of got a, like an exchange rate kind of thing going for whatever um, sacrifice or offering that you're supposed to bring. If you've got wrong currency, they'll change that out. If you're supposed to bring a, a turtle dove to the sacrifice and you've just only got a duck, I mean, they can just kind of help you swap those things around, and they you know, take a little bit of the profit for themselves. And Jesus thought this was awful that it was degrading to the temple, it was, he didn't like it at all. And so Jesus sat down, and he took, he says he took three strands of cord, and he made a whip. Now, I don't know who you think Jesus is, but whip maker, right? That's on the list. He, like, he sits down, and he makes the whip. He makes a whip, and uses this whip, and turns over their tables, and drives them out of the temple courts. And I cannot tell you how many times I've sat, and we've, you, you talk about, you got somebody who's being angry, it's like, man, that, man that's, not, that's not cool. So, well, Jesus got angry. Yeah, like, like one time. Like, and like, like, like uh, is there anybody here like, like defiling the temple? You're just a jerk. No, no, it's righteous anger. It's like, don't use that phrase. And I know some of you right now are feeling particularly called out. But it, it's, it's, we just use it. We, we find one story and we use it to justify all this other stuff. And, and, and the good heart in that and all of that is... I think there is this sense in which we know that we're supposed to be imitating Jesus. I'm supposed to be being like Jesus. I'm supposed to be about what Jesus was about. And it's, sometimes it's just easier, if not bad, to just kind of decide what you're about and find a couple of stories that match you, rather than trying to get a really comprehensive picture about who Jesus was and what his mission was. And this story here we'll be looking at today, I, he kind of sums up after, after, the, after this interaction and this life change that he sees, he kind of sums up really what his mission was. And the story we're going to be looking at today is Luke chapter 19. It's the story of Zacchaeus. Now, how many of you guys grew up going to church and heard the story of Zacchaeus and also know that there's a song? Is that the Zacchaeus song? All right, all right. We're not going to be singing that today. Uh, so... Um, uh, sorry, I apologize. Unless you'd like to right now. If there's any volunteers just want to come up here and sing a song. Anyway, it's a very popular kid's story. And um, we're going to be looking at today Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. <clears throat> now Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now. I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Look at that verse 10 again, because that's kind of his big picture sum up of his mission. For the Son of Man, talking about himself, talking about Jesus, came to seek and to save the lost. So we got this guy Zacchaeus, and they describe him as being really, really short, and so short that he can't really see Jesus. He, he wants to come to this crowd. He wants to see Jesus. So Jesus is beginning to get a name for himself. He's coming into town, 
And lots of people are wanting to just see him, interact with him. Probably a lot of people want to get healed. They want to hear what he has to say. And Zacchaeus wants to be a part of this. And it describes him as a wealthy chief tax collector. And you don't have to be a first century Palestinian person to kind of go tax collector and be like, ugh, right? Everybody kind of has a bit of a negative connotation to that. But we've talked about this a couple weeks ago when Mark was talking about Matthew, that a tax collector in that time would have been, would have been seen uh, partly as a traitor to the country because you're working for the oppressive Roman government. So you're a bit of a sellout and a traitor. And also they were thieves. It was essentially the, the, the scam was... Um, you know, your tax bill might be $10, and the, the tax collector would say 20 and they would just pocket the difference. And there really wasn't anything that you could do about it. So this guy is a traitor, he's a sellout, and not only is he a thief, but he's actually the, the chief thief. He is in charge of the thieves. And so this guy would have just been, in, in Jewish circles, would have just been considered one of the worst types of sinners. Like when, you, when you're reading through the Gospels, and it's describing the worst types of sinners. I mean, it talks about tax collectors and prostitutes. And so it's, it's kind of on this level of just in that society, kind of the worst type of people. And so here he is, and he wants to see Jesus, but he's too short. He can't, he can't, he's not going to be able to see over the crowd. And so he gives a little bit ahead of where Jesus is and climbs up in a tree. It's an incredibly undignified thing to do. Really, for anybody who's not a kid, I guess, but certainly for someone of, of that high of a status um, to do that. But he was desperate to get a glimpse of Jesus. And so then Jesus comes by, and he looks up in that tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm coming to your house today. Those are lyrics from the song. Um, and so then he does, he goes to his house, and people begin, like as always happens when Jesus is hanging out a little too much with sinners, like, they're, they're grumbling about it. And then Zacchaeus has this complete turnaround and begins to re- and wants to give uh, half of his possessions to the poor and wants to give back to everyone that he's defrauded and, and make up for it. And Jesus is like, man, this is a great day. Uh, salvation of life has come to this guy. And this is what I'm about, to seek and save the lost. And so in this story, there's a few things I just want to make sure that we notice to kind of help us understand not only who Jesus is, but who he's called us to be. And the first one is this, is that Zacchaeus was unworthy. He was unworthy of really the time with Jesus. I mean, Jesus is this holy, special teacher. He's a rabbi. He's the son of God. He is a good person, and good people didn't hang out with people like, like Zacchaeus. And here's the thing, Zacchaeus knew it. It wasn't like he was confused about what people thought about him. He wasn't confused about his place in society. I mean, he, had, he knew who he was. But you can tell in him that there is some sense of his, of, of his knowledge of his own brokenness. And, and, and I wonder this, and I've been thinking about this this week, like, why mention that he was short? Like, it's really not essential to the story. Yeah, I mean, it could be like, and Zacchaeus, he wanted to go see, he wanted to hang out with Jesus, but there was a big crowd there and he couldn't see over the crowd, which is normal for people of average height. I mean, if you're average height and there's a crowd of average height people, you're not going to be able to see over it. It's normal to think. So he goes down and climbs up a tree. It's the tree part, right? That, what The steps that he's willing to take. Why bring up the fact that he's short? And I think a couple of things. What, one, it's like, I, th- I think it just points to how bad this dude's situation was. My guess is he wasn't just regular short, but there was like, 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 like severely short. And he had probably been bullied his whole life. He'd been bullied his whole life, and my guess is, is that the decisions that he has made here where his life has gone reflect that. You bully me, I'll show you. And the guy who was bullied becomes the bully, and he becomes the thief, and he begins to take from them. And now he's in this disadvantaged way, and now he he wants to go see Jesus. And what's he going to do? Go to the people he's bullying and say, "Uh, excuse me, uh, can I, can I, I'm even more likely to get punched in the face than for anybody to part past them so he can go past. He had a level of influence where he probably could have found the nearest Roman soldier and said, move these people out of the way. I want to stand right there. But he didn't. In all of his brokenness, he knew that there was, he didn't want to do that. 
Because this wasn't about him exerting influence. This wasn't about him continuing to bully. This was about him having a moment where he recognizes his own brokenness and his own unworthiness. He knew something was off. And so what he was willing to do is that he, goes, he, he, he went out of his way just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. He knew he was unworthy, and then he goes out of his way. He goes out of his way just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. He did something completely and totally undignified. That's kind of the thing that that no adult would do, and certainly not adult in the upper class. What he should have done or could have done was force those people out of his way. Hey, I need you to get out of my way. He's like, we're not moving for you. He's like, huh, interesting. I just found a new tax bill for you. It's actually $300 this time. He could have done that. But that wasn't what this was about. He was broken and he knew it. And he goes out of his way to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Which is very different. I mean, like if you you were here last week and we're looking at the story of this rich guy that came up to Jesus and took this initiative with Jesus, came down to him, bowed down, got on his knees and was like, Oh, good teacher. What, 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 what must I do? Arrogance just dripping out of this guy. I'm good, you're good, we're all good. What should I do? And of course I know the answer, I'm already good. And you're going to tell me that like every other person who's patronized me my whole life because of my wealth and my influence. What Zacchaeus is doing is very different than that. On the surface it may look similar. They're kind of going out of their way to kind of have an interaction with Jesus but you can tell that there's just something different about what Zacchaeus is. He's humbling himself rather than trying to draw, draw praise. He's humbling himself. And, and, and for what? There's no real indication of what Zacchaeus should have expected, what he wanted. Maybe I can just see Jesus. Maybe I can just watch him do something incredible. Maybe I can just overhear him saying something to somebody who's worthy for him to talk to. And maybe if I can just catch a glimpse or hear just a little bit about what Jesus is about, maybe, maybe that will be enough to do something about my brokenness. And so he goes out of his way, does this really undignified thing, just hoping maybe to overhear a conversation Maybe just to see this one that that seems to be bringing hope and life with him wherever he goes. But something that certainly Zacchaeus did not expect happened. The one who was unworthy, who goes out of his way to catch a glimpse. What happens is is that Jesus sought him out. Jesus sought him out. He, he, He walks past, and again, being Jesus, the Son of God, he knew who this guy was and was not surprised to see him in that tree. And he walks past and he points at him and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. It is essential that I do this. And whatever it was that Zacchaeus expected, it wasn't that. Again, he was just hoping for, for, for crumbs just to overhear second or third hand some interaction that Jesus would have. But to have Jesus see him, take notice of him, interact with him, invite himself to his house. Jesus goes out of his way to this person, this broken person who, who, was, who was not well regarded by anybody else in that crowd and was probably, with the exception of maybe a Roman soldier or two who could have been in the crowd, but even still, even with that, he probably was the most hated person in that crowd, the most unworthy of Jesus. And Jesus is like, he could have had dinner with anyone. I'm having dinner with you. Get down, me and you. Of course it caused a stir. Like, here are all these good people doing all the right things, doing everything the right way. He didn't have to have dinner with them. The the worst guy. And 
But this is what Jesus is about. You take a step towards Jesus, a real genuine step. Again, not like the dude last week with all his pompous arrogance and pride. A broken person taking a step towards Jesus. Jesus is going to take a step towards you. And honestly, this is the type of church that we are desperate to try to, to, to be. That we want to be the type of church that you can come in at your most desperate. And you will find us as a church taking a step towards you. Because we know Jesus is doing the same thing. If you visit here, we want you to know that we care. And we strike this weird balance. We try real hard. Because no one wants like, a, like, they, like our church used to put a red ribbon on you. Did you ever try like that? A little red ribbon says visitor. Like who? Like visitor ribbon. Nobody wants that. Every now and then you go to a church like, hey, everybody stand up. Hey, if you're a visitor, you keep standing up. Everybody else sit down. Like nobody wants that, right? But at the same time, we do want, you know, we do want to have a little time. Like, hey, if you see somebody around you don't know, say hi to them. Like, would you fill out a card? We want you to know that we're glad that you're here. It matters to us that you took that step. And even if you're just a person who, like I'm, I'm I've already been walking with God. I'm just maybe looking for a new community. We want you to know it's a place where, we, where you belong. We want you to be here. But if it was a difficult step for you, whether this is your first time or your tenth time, if it was a difficult step for you to be here, if it feels a little bit like climbing in a tree, we just want you to know that you are loved and you are valued and we want to seek you out in a way that you know, that feels like you're uh, valued, not as a spectacle. This is who God has called all of us to be, to seek out those people who need Jesus the most. And, and essentially, what we need to understand, this is what Jesus said, after all of this interaction with this guy, this unworthy guy who goes out of his way to catch a glimpse, Jesus seeks him out, and then he has this, this transformation where suddenly his values begin to completely get turned upside down. He starts to value the poor more than his money. He begins to feel terrible about the people that he's cheated. And he wants to make up for the things that he's done. And Jesus says, salvation has come to here today. And then he describes his mission. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So in Jesus' mind, this interaction with, with him, this summed up his mission. That was his mission. His mission is to seek and to save the lost and the hurting and the broken around him. That was Jesus' mission. And he summed it up. My goal, I am here. This is what I am about. I am here to seek, to look after, and to save, to bring hope and life to the lost. Now, if you've been around church enough, you've been around church really any at all, the word lost has kind of become just kind of good, just church speak. It's just Christian speak. It's, it's lost its real, the power of the real word. Because essentially, Christians, they hear the word lost. You come to church, like, well, lost means not a Christian. There's Christians and they're saved. You know, seek and save the lost. They're saved and there's lost. And so lost just means non-Christian. So you read that, it's like, oh, he came to, to save people who aren't Christians. But there's a real power in that word. This is idea. I mean, really, honestly, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that Jesus is using for a broken and hurting person who needs God. And lost is a very powerful metaphor. Because a lost person is trying to get somewhere. A lost person is trying to get somewhere, and no matter what they try, no matter what they do, they just can't get there. And it seems like the more that they try, the more that they journey, the more time goes on, the worse things seem to get. A, a genuine lost person is aware of their lostness. They know where they wish they were, and they know that where they are is not it. And it says that Jesus' mission is to seek those people out. I'm going to find people like that. Again, which is very different than his interaction last week with someone who's just as wealthy, had just as much status societal-wise, was probably more religious than Zacchaeus. Probably thought he, you know, he thought he was doing everything right. But this guy didn't know he was lost. 
And so Jesus looks at him and is like, man, you're acting like everything's okay. It's not. And I'm going to keep talking to you until you figure it out. And once he realized he was lost, he actually walked away sad rather than doing what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus realized he was lost and, and turned to the one who could help him find life. And it says that Jesus sought him out. Because that's his mission, to seek and save the lost. And that's why there's so many different stories. So many different stories with Jesus, and you, and you see all these different interactions with Jesus. And it seems like, honestly, that in each of these different stories, Jesus is somebody different. In John chapter 3, we meet this guy, Nicodemus, this Jewish religious scholar who comes to Jesus at night because he's, you know, he doesn't necessarily want to be seen by all the other religious people who are against Jesus, but he knows Jesus has something special, and so he's got some questions. And suddenly you see Jesus, the theologian, the scholar, kind of interacting with him. We see Jesus with a woman who was caught in adultery. We, we, we see overwhelming compassion with just a little bit of truth at the end. We see a more confrontational Jesus in John chapter 4 with this woman who, was, um, who, who, was, who had made some really bad life choices and because of that was going to get water at a well when no one else was there. And Jesus comes and talks to her, which is completely inappropriate for him to talk to a Samaritan woman. It was racially inappropriate. It was gender-wise it was inappropriate. Sin-wise it was inappropriate. We see this compassion initiative that he takes but he's a lot more confrontational with her. But then, again, it's still overwhelmingly compassionate. It's like Jesus is a different person in every one of these stories, when in fact he's not the same person. It's the people that he's interacting with that are different. What is the same about Jesus is the mission is the same. Here is a lost person that either helped them understand that they're lost, or they are lost and they know it, and I want to bring hope and life to them. That is the mission. So whatever this person needs, whatever the situation calls for, Jesus will do and be what he has to be to seek and save the ones who are lost. And there's two different groups of people here that desperately need to hear this message. And the first are the people who are lost. You're lost, and, you, and you, you're, you know life's not right, you know it's not working, and you know somehow in your head that church has some answers to that, and it just feels like sometimes if I can just get the church energy boost, I get the church energy boost, it feels better. And I'm telling you, it's so much more than an energy boost. It's so much more than being adjacent to people who are passionate about God. It is about Jesus Christ coming and seeking after you, and He's wanting to, bring, he's wanting to save you. He's wanting to give you hope and life, and that comes by fully following Him and trusting that your real problem is your sin and that God offers forgiveness through the death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus. He is seeking you out so that you will embrace that. You have come to the right place. Now embrace the one who is offering you hope and life. And if that's you, if this is your first time or it's your 50th time, our hope and our prayer is that you will find that. That you will come here looking for hope and life and you will find it in Jesus. For the rest of us, it is overwhelmingly important that you figure out that it is your mission to be about Jesus' mission. Jesus was actively seeking people that he could bring hope and life to. And we need God to give us those types of eyes. You're not going to find anybody looking to talk to you who's climbing up a tree. If you do, call 911. But I tell you, there are people just as obvious that God has placed in your life that are desperate for hope and life in Jesus Christ. And God has called you 
to step into their life, to bring hope and life to them. And so as we have our time of prayer, let's just pray for each other. Let's pray for those of us who are here who have, um, who still just haven't fully embraced who Jesus Christ is and are here and they're lost. That this will be the day that they can find hope and life in Jesus. But let's also pray for each other that God will give us the eyes to see the people that He is putting in our path each and every day. That with an act of kindness a kind word, a church invitation, an invitation for dinner, a generous gift, where simple acts can make a huge difference in the life of someone who is lost and is desperate for life with God. So as always, we've got lots of different ways to do that. Our prayer team is back there. We'd love to pray with you. I mean, if you feel like I need a little bit more help and encouragement, what it really means to find hope in life, they would love to help you with that. If you have any other burden of any kind, they'll love to pray with you. But we've got prayer candles, communion, cross where you can pray. We're going to worship. We're going to give. Lots of different ways to respond. But let's pray that God will give all of us here today that life and that we can bring hope and life to a world that needs it. Let's pray. God, I thank you. God, I thank you for Zacchaeus. God, I thank you that, you that you just took this hurt and broken and desperate man and God, that he, he took that step towards you. But God, I thank you that you sought him out. God, he didn't have to find the way himself because he knew he couldn't. And God, and I thank you that that's true for all of us. That all of us here We can't find it on our own. We need you, and so we just thank you that you seek us out. And so, God, I pray for those of us who still need to find you that we would today. But, God, that you would give all of us a passion and a heart to find people around us who are in need of you and be carriers of hope and life to them. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.